kind of sticking to what I was doing over our last three weeks. I'm just bringing my, my journal with me and instead of my iPad. may go back to that one day, but I just felt like I wanted to stick to my handwritten notes. So you just be praying for the Holy Spirit to give me discernment to read my own handwriting. Anybody ever struggle with that? Am I the, oh, yes. Yeah, so we, we're all, many of us, in the same boat. So I try to type everything, but I just felt like just, I don't know, just kind of getting down to the uh, nitty-gritty, just right out of our journals. I hope you brought your Bibles today and your journals. I have sent an outline to Brother Philip, and uh, I'm, I'm going to leave it up to him what of the outline he puts on the screen because I want us to, to learn how to wield our sword, learn how to operate with this weapon that the Lord has given us. We need to know. We need to know. Jesus said to a crowd, he said, you search the scriptures and them you think you have eternal life. And he was speaking to those religious busybodies who thought they knew what the scriptures were saying. And they really were missing it all together. And he spoke in simple stories and parables. And those that were religiously high-minded, they never could understand what Jesus was saying. And so this word God gave us is not to confuse us. It is to strengthen us. And so I want to encourage you, please bring your Bibles to church. And maybe you're one who likes to have a digital copy in front of you on your cell phone or your, your iPad or your Kindle. That's all fine. As long as you can learn how to wield your weapon. Amen. Today, we're going to be talking about the real Superman. The real Superman. We're going to start a series today, and it's probably going to go through the month of April. As next week is Resurrection Sunday. And we're going to be continually preaching on, uh, and the title of my message today is The Real Superman, but we're going to continually be preaching on various characteristics and aspects of who Jesus is and how that influences and should affect our lives and our faith. And today, we're going to start in Hebrews chapter 4, starting with verse 14. Hebrews chapter 4, starting with verse 14. We're just going to read three verses of Scripture. And then I just want to give a a small introduction uh, before we get into these verses. Hebrews chapter 4, starting with verse 14. I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible. And the Bible says, Therefore... Since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Let us hold fast our confession. He goes, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. Now, I had to back up and read that a few times because I'm not real smart with math, but I think I remember in algebra, if you have a double, double negative, it actually makes a what? A positive. So he goes, for we do not, negative, have a high priest who cannot. There's another negative, which means we got a positive here. We have a high priest that sympathizes with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are yet without sin. I'm going to read that verse again, uh, that part of the verse. Uh, He's one who has been tempted in all things like we are. He didn't sin. Verse 16, therefore, the reason the word therefore is therefore, it is therefore us to apply the scriptures. Was that confusing or what? That's what it's there for. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence. And often we come to God, Brother Mike, not confidently. And I don't believe it's often that we are doubting God's ability as much as we just know our own capability to fail. We're ashamed of our own human frailty. And so we feel so unworthy to drag ourselves into the presence of such a holy God. But here we're told to come to him in confidence to the throne of grace 
that we may receive mercy, find grace, help in a time of need. Today I'm going to talk about the real Superman. You know, those of you who are uh, superhero buffs and comic buffs, you just have to bear with me because I'm not preaching on comic strips. I'm not drawing a line between DC Comics or Marvel and who's the best or the greatest. I just want to take a few moments and talk about that great American hero, not the blonde-headed guy that came on Wednesday nights. I'm going to talk about Superman, the first American comic strip superhero in 1938. He made his debut. You've probably heard this. He was faster than a speeding bullet, more powerful than a locomotive. He's able to leap tall buildings with a single bound. Look, up in the sky, it's a bird. It's a plane. No, it's Superman. He was able to do great feats no human man was able to do. His strength superseded that of the strongest of the strong, and they called him Superman. Yet he had a weakness, and his weakness was kryptonite. And as he was exposed to kryptonite, which was a small fragment of his destroyed, exploded planet, the, the longer he was exposed, the weaker Superman became. It could kill him. The ratings of this superhero character just began to dwindle from 1938. So then in 1992, DC Comics felt they needed to boost the ratings. So they did something you wouldn't expect. They developed a comic devoted to the death of Superman. He was in the battle for the world and for his own life with an alien-type creature called Doomsday. Am, am I getting it right so far? And in that fight to destroy Doomsday, Superman sacrificed himself to save Metropolis and the world, and he died. The last picture had Lois Lane holding the, the tattered body of Superman in her arms, and it left the world in shock because Superman had died. America's comic book hero was dead. And while many storylines came out of this tragic loss, the original, the one and only Superman was gone. But all of that is comic books and imagination. Today, I want to introduce you to the real Superman. In our scriptures, the writer of Hebrews called him a great high priest. And when I was reading this, I got to thinking, most of us in Western culture have no idea really what that means. I would say that the religious people of America, the closest group that would probably come close to understanding that would, would be our, our Catholic brothers and sisters because of the priest and confession booths and absolving sins and confessing to a priest at Mass, having communion, and they would understand. But what does it mean to have a great high priest? Because we, most here, we don't, a Jewish person would understand, but we, except for the little bit we've heard somebody preach, we just don't grasp or wrap our head around what this means for us. Strange concept. I'm going to just take a few moments. Listen to some of the duties that God, responsibilities, authorities, that God in the Scriptures gave the high priests. We, we find out that in 2 Chronicles 19.11, the high priest was given authority over the other priests. He was responsible for uh, giving and distributing 
um, the gifts and the responsibilities in the Old Testament temple, <clears throat> Old Testament tabernacle to those other priests. He was in control. God gave him that authority. <clears throat> the Old Testament high priest had uh, on him uh, these engraved dice-like stones, the Urim and the Thummim, and these two stones, and there's not a lot written on them, but, but God gave him these stones as instruments of discernment so that the high priest, when someone would bring a story to him, hey, my, my, my neighbor stole my cows, the neighbor saying, I didn't steal his cows, then he would go to God and he would pray, and with those instruments, he would determine <clears throat> which was false and which was true. And he was, be, he was able to have discerning with these two engraved stones. The high priest in Leviticus chapter 4 had the responsibility to offer the sin offering for himself and for the nation of Israel. This was also in Numbers chapter 35, verse 28. We discover that when the high priest that was established by God uh, come to the, the time of his death and he passed away and they had the mourning ceremony and, and, and buried that high priest that there were cities scattered throughout the nation. They were called cities of refuge and those cities of refuge were places where if someone was to accidentally kill a neighbor, accidentally slaughter a child, that they could go to the city of refuge and stay there and be safe from being stoned because they still killed somebody even though they didn't mean it. But in the year that the high priest died, when he died, the law said anybody who was guilty of these, and they were in those cities of refuge, all of a sudden, they were written a bill of freedom, and all of their sins were absolved, and they were able to go back to their families. They were able to go back to life as it was, and no one would hold them accountable because they were made free when the high priest died. Follow me. The most important duty was performed on the Day of Atonement. Only the high priest was allowed into the most holy place, the place of the presence of God. His job was to sprinkle the blood of a spotless lamb on the mercy seat, the lid that sat on the Ark of the Covenant. No, Indiana Jones was not there. This was only once a year the mercy seat was considered God's throne on the earth. Get a picture. There was a thick, heavy veil that separated the rest of the world, the rest of the religious people, from where God's presence was. That little box called the Ark of the Covenant had a seat or a lid upon it that had two cherubim with wings outstretched toward one another. And when God was pleased with the sacrifice that was brought him for the sins, God, in, in glowing, uh, radiant form, would come down and sit upon that mercy seat in such a way that that darkened, most holy place would illuminate with the presence of God. And it was a sign that God had come down and had forgiven the sins of the nation. Understanding these roles of this high priest is going to help us better understand the role of the great high priest that this writer is speaking about here in Hebrews chapter 4. Because Christ become the high priest, but the Lamb of God, who died to take away the sins once and for all. And Hebrews 10.10 10 says, By this we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. That means when Jesus died, he died to take away all our sins. He died to take away <clears throat> those sins that we've asked God to forgive us in the past, but they keep creeping out of the closet and keep reminding us, oh, you remember when you failed back when? And he's saying he died once for all. If you remember them, it's the devil reminding you, or you're reminding yourself God is not remembering them anymore because he took care of them. That which we may do in the future to fail God. Because he once died for all, 
He's already taken care of them. Now, that doesn't mean that we can live any which way without asking for forgiveness. We need to ask for forgiveness of our sins. We need to make sure that our calling and election, <clears throat> excuse me, is right before God. <clears throat> Allergies, uh, right before God. Anybody struggle with allergies? Lord, help us today. We need to pray for God to heal us. And where we are today, we dragged ourselves into the house of the Lord. And if you come here today and you know there's sin to your charge, you've got red in your ledger and it needs to be absolved. Jesus is your high priest that died to handle those sins today. He's that great high priest. <clears throat> Not only did this real superman become our great high priest, the Bible says here that he passed through the heavens. He passed through the heavens. Now, you may not think about that, but this is what I thought about. What does that mean, pass through the heavens? I would like to know. God, help me understand. You didn't give me this word to confound me and cause me to be so confused that I'll never understand the truth of the word. So I began to think, what does pass through the heavens mean? And it's like the Holy Spirit began to show me these little elements. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8 and 9, Ephesians 4, 8 and 9, the Bible says, Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led captures, or captive a host of captives. And he gave gifts to men, verse 9 of Ephesians chapter 4. Now this expression, he ascended. What does it mean except that he also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He descended first before he ascended. This is what it means. Sometime between today and next Sunday, some 2,000 years ago, on a Friday afternoon, give or take, this man called Jesus was hanged on a cross. And he shed his life's blood for the sins of the whole world. He gave his life. Bible says, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And he gave up the ghost. That's what the Bible says. And they, take, they took his body off the cross. They prepared it for burial. They wrapped him in burial. They, they put the, the burial spices and herbs on his body and buried him in a borrowed tomb. And for three days, Christ's body laid in that tomb. Everybody got that so far? That's what they could see with their eye. But see, he's not just a man. He's superman. He's the supernatural man. Follow me here. Because during those three days, there were some things going on. He descended to the lower parts of the earth. Because in the lower parts of the earth was a chamber divided in two compartments called Hades. Anyone heard this before? It was lower Hades and upper Hades. The upper Hades was called either Abraham's bosom or paradise. And all the Old Testament saints that believed God and it was counted to them as righteousness were waiting there for the Messiah to come to them and preach that he was the Messiah and believing in him and following him would, would open the door to paradise or Abraham's bosom and carry them from upper Hades into the presence of God Jehovah. And so Jesus, for three days, went to the heart of the earth, and he began to preach to those who believed there was going to be a Messiah, and they saw him face to face. Now, I like the way the, 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 the songwriter Carmen put it. He said, Lazarus opened up his eyes, and he was in the other parts of the earth, and there was Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Samson, and all the believers uh, uh, of the Old Testament. And they were all talking about how they were looking forward to seeing him. And then Lazarus said, y'all, I know him in a way y'all never did. I saw him open blinded eyes. I, I saw him uh, turn water into wine. I saw him break bread and feed 5,000 and he just kept talking to them. I like the way the song went. He says, as a matter of fact, I, I hear him calling me right now. I think I can. And up at the tomb, Jesus was saying, Lazarus, come forth. And he said, boys, I'm sorry. I got to get up out of here because I hear him calling my name. 
The Bible lets us know there is a compartment called paradise or Abraham's bosom. We read this when Jesus gave us a story of the rich man and of Lazarus, the, the, the poor man that died with the sores on him. And when they both opened their eyes, the rich man opened up his eyes in the flame, flaming torments of hell, lower Hades. And, and, the, and the poor man opened up his eyes and there he was in the arms of Abraham, his father. And there was a great gulf. There was a division. And, and the rich man was asking for just somebody touch a little little bit of water on their finger and give it to them. But they said, I can't because there's a great gulf between us. During the three days that he was in the grave, Jesus was preaching. He was the Messiah, but that's not all. Because Jesus, he, he lets us know in Revelation chapter 1, 18, he walked over to the devil. He said, all right, hand over those keys because he says I am the living one I was dead and behold I'm alive forevermore and now I have the keys of death and hell he preached deliverance to those captives and he led them to heaven and he took the keys of death and hell from Satan himself I'm talking about the Superman anybody getting the picture today about the real Superman Three days pass. And Sister Ann, he got up. Yeah. I can't remember how the story goes, and maybe I would need to get Josh up here to help me with this at this point. But somehow they took the genes or the genetics or pieces of Superman and they created four or five other supermen to help carry on the legacy of Superman. They didn't do that to Jesus. He got up. After three days of preaching and deliverance, three days of taking the keys of death and hell from the devil, he breathed back into those dead lungs, and, and he got up. Somebody look at your neighbor and say, he got up. Yeah. There's a little cemetery over in the edge of Smithfield across from Brightleaf Packing, Packaging, uh, Carolina Packers. And sometimes I go there, and I've got grandparents that are laid there. And sometimes I just go there. I know my granddad's not there. He's in the presence of the Lord, but I just, it helps me. And I sit there, and I'm like, Granddad, I'm doing the best that I know to do to carry on the legacy that you left. And I know he's not listening to me here, but maybe God just gave him some spiritual ears, and he's looking down at little old me whining at his grave. He's like, son, I'm not even down there. I'm not even down there in that grave. My body might be down there, but one day the Bible says that the, the, the Lord himself is going to descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. And when he does, the dead in Christ are going to rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, and there shall we ever be with the Lord. And the Bible says we are to comfort one another with these words. Somebody just needs to praise him right now. This isn't all there is. We got a heaven we're going to, and we need to worship him. And the Superman and made it all available. Amen. That's the real Superman. He got up. So not only is he the great high priest, not only did he descend to the lower parts of the earth and he delivered those who were there and took them to the presence of God the Father, take the keys of death and hell, but the Bible says here, because this is where I started us, he passed through the heavens. Well, what does that mean? He had to go through hell to get us where he wants to get us. Let me tell you, Jesus went through hell to get us to glory. You need to understand, we've never really been through hell like Jesus did, but he did so that you and I could have peace and joy. We could have eternal life and forgiveness and deliverance from sin. Amen? He passed through the heavens. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2 talks to us about there being a prince of the power of the air. It says, you formerly walked according to the course or the way of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. He called it the spirit of disobedience or the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. And in Daniel chapter 10, we read Daniel had been praying for 21 days. Anybody ever prayed and you felt like the heavens were brass? You ever prayed and you're like, I wonder if God is hearing me? Yes. Because Michael the archangel showed up after 21 days and he told Daniel, he said, look, God heard you on the first day that you prayed. God always hears us when we pray. 
He said, but let me tell you, the prince of Persia resisted me for 21 days. Well, I believe Michael the archangel was descending from the throne in glory, and he had to come through the air, airways, the heavens, to get to where Daniel was, and the prince of Persia was resisting him to keep the answer from God to getting to God's man. So when we feel that resistance in prayer, keep praying because the answer is on the way. We've got to punch through the clouds. We've got to punch through the storm and keep praying and believing because one day our, our prayer is going to be answered. God is going to do it. I'm trying to let you know something. Satan's realm is the airways. That's why we have so much problem with temptation with radio listening to the wrong music, with television, watching the wrong stuff, with social media, uh, the internet, Googling things that we shouldn't Google. Well, let me just kind of see and accidentally fall on something we shouldn't be looking at. We have problems with the airways because he's the prince of the power of the air. Billboards that are supposed to be selling tennis shoes having scantily clad women on there. Are they selling tennis shoes or something else? I'm just saying, he's the prince of the power of the air to draw our attention away from the real Superman. Satan's domain is in that middle heaven, if you will. The atmosphere is Satan's domain. That's where he causes so much ruckus. But let's listen to what the Scripture tells us here. But we have a great high priest that passed through the heavens. He passed right on through it. There was nothing the devil could do to stop him. There wasn't a demon. There wasn't enough demons. The devil and all his demons, they could play Red Rover and lock arms. Jesus still broke through. Because the Bible says he passed through. Boys, I'm just on my way through here. Y'all just sit over there. Go over there and practice falling down. Because I'm on my way to my father. And he passed through. He went through hell. And then he passed through the devil's camp to get to heaven for a reason. Because the Bible says, I like what Ephesians chapter 1. That we are to know what the surpassing greatness of his power to us who believe in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he wrought in Christ Jesus when he raised him from the dead, we've talked about that, and seated him at his right hand in heavenly places. He passed through the heavens to get here. Far above all rule, far above all authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age but also in the one to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as head and all things to the church. He went to hell for you and I, and he delivered those in upper Hades, keys of death and hell because he's the real Superman. And he passed through the heavens, kicking devils out of the way. He made it back to his Father in heaven. I believe he put that robe back on, straightened it, and his crown because he is the king of kings he is the lord of lords and he sat down at the father's right hand and the bible says hit that's where he is right now and it says he's ever interceding for you and i he's saying lord god father help him make it one more day father help him make it over that hill help him get through that storm help judy get to that mri help us make it through that help him make it through this problem and he is praying for you and i so that we make it through this life passed through the heavens into his glory. Somebody praise him today. He's a great high priest. He passed through the heavens. It says here he is Jesus, the Son of God. I'm going to say it again. He's Jesus, the Son of God. John the Baptist called him the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. Blind Bartimaeus called him a son of David. Would you have mercy on me? The demon says, what have we to do with you, you holy one of God? And then God the Father said, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well. 
well pleased. He is the Son of the living God, and He deserves all praise and glory and honor and majesty today. Somebody praise Him. Somebody glorify His name. Brother J.D., do you have to get exuberant like that? No, I don't have to. I get to. This right here is powerful. Verse 15 says, We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. This superman understands. He sympathizes with our weaknesses. Matthew chapter 4, we read that Jesus was led by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, into the wilderness for a 40-day fast. And during those 40 days, the devil came to him and tempted him. Tempted him to turn stone into bread. Tempted him with all the kingdoms of the world, if he would just bow down and worship him. Tempted him to throw himself off of the, the pinnacle of the temple so that the angels would keep him from gushing his, his guts out on the ground. Satan twisted the truth of Scripture to get him to yield to temptation. When he commanded him or tempted him to command the stones to be turned to bread, that was the, according to 1 John chapter 2, verse 16, that was the lust of the flesh. He tempted him with the lust of the eyes. You see all these kingdoms? You can have this. Many times I've, I've read stories, documentaries of, of great rock stars and country music artist who grew up in a church and sang in church choirs. The lady who was a part of the Jim Baker scandal in his fall, Jessica Hahn, appeared in a video in the 80s. I believe the guy's name was Sam. That was the singer. I can't remember his last name. He used to be a Pentecostal preacher, but denied his faith because Satan offered him the kingdoms of the world, if he would just bow down. He died of a heart attack. Hey, if I could just work a little bit more overtime, I can get that cabin in the mountains. If you can just put a few more hours in, get that time and a half, you can purchase that, that, that camper or that new yatchet that you've been wanting. I'm not saying God's saying there's anything wrong with us having things and taking vacations. And if God prospers us and it doesn't become our God, God wants to prosper us so the world can say, how is it that you can do all that, God? I pay my tithes. No, I give my tithes and my offerings. And every time I do, God just keeps blessing me, keeps pouring in him. Hey, won't you, won't you go on vacation with me because I'm getting ready to have a week of, of solace and read my Bible. <laughs> And won't you come and let me talk to you about the Lord for a week? That's all right, you go. If we use those things, but the lust of the eyes say, don't that look really good? My granddad on my, grand, on my mom's side was offered a second shift job. A pay raise. They were faithful to church. They were faithful to God. Faithful with their giving. Second shift, started keeping him out of Wednesday night. Then he's getting in so late Sunday night, he'd be so tired to get out of bed on Sunday morning. Then it was Sunday school. Then it was morning worship. Then like, you know, well, why we even need to go? We're missing Wednesday night and Sunday school and Sunday morning. Why even go Sunday night? And my grandparents lost out with God for some extended period of time because Satan said, doesn't. That kingdom looked really good to you. If you will bow down and worship me, I will give you that. The lust of the eyes. And then the pride of life. Cast yourself off the temple and the father will send 
your God. He'll send angels to keep you from dashing your foot against the stone. A misuse of power. But the Bible says here, he did not sin. He was tempted, but he did not sin. He defeated Satan with the word of God. And on Calvary, he beat the devil with the ugly stick. Then finally, because he's our high priest, because he passed through the heavens, he's the son of God. He's our high priest that feels our weaknesses and understands we can come before him with confidence. We don't normally have that sense of, oh, I can just go to God. But we can. We can come to him no matter what condition we're in. He's waiting for us. Brother Danny, there was a song in the 80s. He was there all the time. He was there all the time. Waiting patiently in line. He was there all the time. Anyone remember the song? He was there all the time. He was there all the time. Waiting patiently in line. He was there all the time waiting for us to realize he's the real superman we've tried to fix it oh i'll do better i'll stop doing this i'll quit slapping you around i'll put down the bottle these things that i'm addicted to i i i'll, I'll quit having these sexual excursions in my life and we try to stop. We try to turn over the new leaves. And we've got all these other things and people in line. And somewhere way back there, we've pushed him to the back of the line. But he's there. And he's saying, look, don't you think it's time to confidently come to me and realize you can't fix it? You can't fix it. You can't stop. You can't, you can't make enough New Year's resolutions to fix it. The pain, the bitterness, the hurt. You can try to handle it yourself, but the answer is found with the real Superman. And he's saying you can come to the throne of grace. You can find grace. You can find mercy. You can find help in the time of your need. Would you stand to your feet? He's our real Superman. And Doomsday has no authority over him. And they tried to put him down, and he just wouldn't stay there. He's the real Superman. And if you haven't, you need to get a Bible, and you need to read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John just to see how great a superman he is. And when I say superman, he's supernatural, yet he's still man. And he wants us to bring it to him, whatever it is. So I'd like to ask you to do something. Just with your eyes closed, think about it. Do you, do you need to come talk to God about something. Is there anything right now you feel you just need to find a spot in this altar and say, God, I'm coming because you promised in that word right there that I could draw near with confidence. My pastor just told me, Father, it don't matter what it is, I can bring it to you you're not going to cast me out. You're not going to be ashamed and that you can touch me. Maybe it's fear. Maybe you have bitterness and you've been done wrong, but you need mercy and grace and help today.
So I wonder, is there anyone that will come to this altar by faith and believe this is now going to be the throne of grace and you're going to bring it to him and say, I'm giving it to God. Is there anyone say, I want, I've got something right now I need to bring to God. And if you do, would you come? Would you come? Would you bring it to God? He's here. He wants you to bring it to him. Hadn't the burden been too heavy? Hadn't it been on you long enough? Oh, come find grace. Find mercy. Find the help you need right now in the time of your need. Would you come? Because Jesus Christ, the real Superman, wants to meet you here. Yes. He said, cast all of your cares upon me, for I care for you. It's not too big for Superman. He can handle it. He carried it all to the cross. And he nailed it there for you to have your victory and your deliverance, your freedom, your healing, your miracle today. Is there anyone else? As these have come, let's all bow our heads so we can pray. Father, I believe that this was a walk of faith. God, I, I'm not aware of every circumstance that is represented by the person or persons that are in this altar. But God, some of them I have knowledge of. Some of them I do not know. It's just the, the needs of the heart. Maybe silently there, been trying to carry the burden, to shoulder them up themselves. God, these that have come, you see their need. God, I pray for fresh revelation of your love and your mercy. God, those that are in this altar right now need your help. They're carrying a heavy load. Lord, some of them for their families. Some for direction. Lord, in life and with jobs. Lord, God, marriages. Lord, healing in their bodies and in their family members. And they need an answer today, Father. If not a complete answer and solution, at least some resolve in their spirit that you are taking care of the need. I ask you, Father, would you move? Lord, send that perfect peace. Pour your grace out in this sanctuary, in this altar today. Father, show mercy. Lord, the mercy that we find at the mercy seat, the throne of grace. Lord, send the help that is needed. My words, God, right now may not be adequate enough prayer. So, God, you move the way that these that are in this altar need you to move. Answer their need. God, in such a way, when, when they leave this altar, they're going to leave, as this scripture says, with confidence that you have heard their prayer. Now, Father, I thank you that you've heard us. God, you see the need. We've presented it to you. We've cast our care upon you. Lord, we want to trade our sorrows that we would have a garment of praise. We would have the oil of joy today. Lord, in the confidence that you have answered, we thank you for this. Lord, when we stand from this altar and we start walking back to our seat, Lord, it is a walk of faith. You have heard us 
and we worship you that you have answered our prayer, that you have heard my heart. God, the, the pain in my voice, the struggle that I've been through, God, I thank you. I praise you in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Lord, we worship you. Congregation, would you just worship now? As these continue to pray, would you just intercede on their behalf? Just pray for them that God would meet their need. That when they, when they face this circumstance again, that a solution is going to, to come about because of it. Lord, we praise you. Lord, we praise you. We thank you. Yes, Father. Lord, to that, that broken spirit that feels like it's there all by themselves. God, that they've been carrying this all along. I pray that you would come along their side and you would undergird them right now in the name of Jesus. Oh, God, I, I feel this with all my heart. Lord, wrap your great big arms around them right now and let them feel your love and your warmth, your closeness that they are not alone. They are not alone. God, you're with them. They're going to make it. They are victorious. They are more than a conqueror. I give you praise, Lord. I give you praise. Hallelujah. Church, if you believe with me that God has heard these prayers, would you take your hands and put them together with me as we honor God with them? The Bible says to clap your hands, all you people, and to shout to the Lord the voice of triumph. If you study the life of David, the Bible says that he was a man after God's own heart. But when you study his life, David had some flaws, man. David had some struggles. But he still wrote the majority of the Psalms, and the most of them is this sinful, broken, fallible king would continually just give God praise in the midst of it all. Whether it was somebody trying to kill him or he had sinned gravely before God, David found time to pin down, God, I worship you. God, I love you. God, I glorify your name. So the next time the, te the devil brings that junk, whatever that junk is, in your face, just began to praise God. Now, I'm going to close with this thought. Today's Palm Sunday, and somewhere around 2,000 years ago, Jesus had commanded a couple of his disciples to go get an unused donkey, and they put their coats on that donkey, and Jesus came riding into town on the donkey. We call it, we call it Palm Sunday. In the scriptures, they call it the triumphal entry. And they were laying down palm branches in front of him, but it didn't stop there. And I was almost, I was that close to wanting to call today uh, when I praise as a part of last week. So let's, let's say it's tying last series into this series, when I praise. Because with all that being said, they said Jesus was coming into town. They said, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And they just worshiped and they worshiped and they worshiped. And so I want to encourage you. In the face of your storms and battles, just find somewhere. Get along with God and worship. Praise the Lord. I'd like to ask, as we're dismissed, if a couple of sisters could just come and gather around uh, Sister Bradshaw and just pray with her. You are dismissed. Thank you for being in the house of the Lord today.